Good morning. My name is Homer Erickson, and I have the privilege of being Dean of the Neely School of Business at TCU, and I want to welcome you to our third Tandy Executive Speaker Series uh, this year. It uh, should be a very entertaining morning, I think, so I'm, I'm, really, I'm looking forward to it probably as much as you are. It should be very exciting. Uh, this is an important series to us. We really want to be a thought leader and re really promote good and crucial and critical and interesting conversations in the community, and hopefully we'll be doing that today. Uh, before we introduce our speaker, I would like to thank our sponsors. As always, our lead sponsor and platinum sponsor is Frost Bank. You know, it's kind of different today not being in the blues. So I always look for where are people today. But anyway, Frost Bank tables are somewhere around here. Uh, and I want to thank Frost Bank. Uh, our gold sponsor, uh, the Fort Worth Business Press. Uh, the silver sponsors are Cockrell Innovation and the Balcom Agency. And our bronze sponsors are the Acme Brick and Lindbeck. Uh, please join me in, in thanking our sponsors. Well, I want to get right on with our uh, introduction of our, our speaker today. It's, you've seen his bio, but I want to highlight a couple of things. Uh, we're very pleased, actually. We count him as one of ours now, because this week he's spending as the Green Honors Professor uh, in the Neely School at TCU, so we're very honored to have him here. So we'll count him as our faculty member as long as he would like, uh, actually. But Dr. Jeff, Jeffrey Pfeffer is the Thomas D. D. Uh, II Professor of Organizational Behavior at the Graduate School of Business at Stanford University. He's been there since 1979. He's the author uh, or co-author of more than 120 articles and book chapters and 13 books, and we'll be talking about one of those today. Uh, he's appeared on CBS Sunday Morning, 60 Minutes, CNBC, and he's been quoted and featured in news articles and other media around the world. He's presented seminars in 34 different countries through the years, um, and has obviously consulted with numerous companies all over the world as well. He received his BS and MS degrees from Carnegie Mellon University and his PhD from Stanford, and he serves on the board of directors of Audible Magic, Quantum Leap Healthcare, and in San Francisco Playhouse. We are very privileged and excited to have Dr. Jeffrey Pepper. Jeff. As always, we'll have a few questions that I'll do first, and then we'll open it up for some Q&A with the audience here in just a few minutes. Uh, let's, let's just start first and just tell us a little bit about your background. Why did you choose, of all the things you could have studied in the world, chemistry and physics and things, you decided to study business and organizational behavior? Why did, why did that capture your attention? Well, I almost went uh, to study finance. Um, when I was uh, g going to get my PhD, but I thought all the problems in finance had been pretty well solved, yeah. little did I know. <laughs> <laughs> and I thought organizational behavior would provide a, a better opportunity. Um, wow, look at you! I know. <laughs> They're beautiful. That's cool. That's, you know. <laughs> we, have, we, have, we have powers that we didn't even know. Exactly. And they've taken care of so, so it struck me that, and actually this is career advice I still give students in my past the power class, that you want to, that you want to pick um, that you want to pick an area where you have an opportunity, I think, to make a, uh, a substantial contribution. And the reason why you have that opportunity is because not everything has been solved and resolved. And when I when I was thinking of going back for my PhD, I mean, they, Bill Sharp had invented the capital asset pricing model the risk return stuff had been pretty well defined. So I wanted to pick an area that seemed to be more wide open. And it still is wide open, but anyway, it was a good choice because in spite of my limited talents, I was able to become a full professor in my early 30s. So everything was fine. So. You know, one of the books that you did a few years ago uh, was called, What Were They Thinking? Unconventional Thoughts About Management or Approaches to Management? Unconventional so, Wisdom About wisdom management. management. So tell us about that wisdom. What was that about, that book? Well, as everybody in this room knows, if you just look at what goes on in the world on a daily basis, organiz or it's now going the other direction. I like that. <laughs> as, long, as long as it doesn't come down, we're fine. Uh, 
is if you look at the, on a daily basis, you, I think, see companies do things and you say, literally, what were they thinking? Uh, because so many organizations behave and do things in ways inconsistent with the evidence. And so I tried to, what I tried to do in this book, which was actually an expansion. I, for many years, wrote a column for Business 2.0, uh, the 650,000 circulation business magazine. I out-survived the magazine. The magazine's gone. I'm still here. Uh, but, uh, <laughs> but business two point. So I wrote a bunch of columns, and uh, and I put I expanded th those columns or some of them uh, in into this book. Um, and and the theme is really, I think companies don't often think very systematically or in an evidence way about what they're doing. And in particular, many organizations don't take feedback effects into account. So, you know, companies say, okay, we're going to cut salaries. That's interesting. We're going to save money. Well, you only save money if the people whose salaries you've cut either, number one, don't leave or still do the same level of work. If you cut their salaries and they leave or they stop working, which is even worse, then you probably haven't saved money at all. Um, I think one of the columns I wrote, which is very relevant to all of you as you watch American Airlines merge with U.S. Airways or whatever it's called today, um, is called Curbing the Urge to Merge. And, you know, I think if you pick up any of the newspapers, there's all kinds of statements made about airlines and airline mergers, and it's just astonishing to me how those statements are based upon almost no facts. Um, and, you know, so people say, oh, you've got to be a big airline in order to be, I don't know what, successful or whatever. And you can do this yourself. I mean, after you leave here, go look at, go do a Google search on the following uh, search items, and you'll quickly come up with the list. You know, world's best airlines, United States best airlines, best on-time performance, largest airlines, most profitable airlines, and for the most part, you will see almost no overlap. That the, that the world's best airlines are smaller, that the most profitable airlines, and by the way, the lowest cost airlines are not the biggest ones. So I, you know, I just have fun writing articles, and in this case, a um, collection of columns, about how crazy people are and what they do, so. <laughs> so. So when you work with companies, do they, do they listen? Do they, are you able to help them be smarter? Um, I would like to say yes, but to that, uh, the truth is, in the words of my wife, who's much wiser than I am, um, when the student is ready, the teacher will appear. And, uh, and sometimes the students aren't ready when the teacher appears. So, <laughs> so, so I, would say, I would say it's mixed. I would say some, some organizations actually do pay attention and I think they've you know, done good things like overcome the knowing doing gap and try to put evidence-based management into practice. And some don't. I think um, one of the things that I've learned from working with organizations over the years is that organizations are pretty much like people. Everyone wants change and no one wants to do anything differently. Uh, so, you know, everyone wants, everyone wants to live longer and eat healthier, but of course no one actually wants to change what they put in their mouth. Um, companies, I think, oftentimes want different and better and more superior levels of results, but they really don't want to change in a fundamental way their cultures and their values and how they manage people. So it's trying to get them over that and to, to understand that they actually have to do things differently and think differently if they want to have a better level of results. Well, let's kind of build on that values piece. The, <clears throat> I saw a survey recently that uh, they asked Americans about what institutions do you have the greatest confidence in. Is this the trust index? <clears throat> um, uh-huh. Yep. And it was that 31% said they had great confidence in small business. 5% said that they had great confidence in big business. First of all, pretty low in both accounts, but can you talk reflect about maybe the difference between small business, big business, the perception of, of people about that? Well, that must be the Edelman Trust Index. And actually, a couple of weeks ago, I was on a panel in San Francisco with Mr. Edelman, so I, yeah. knows, I know something about uh, the Trust Index. Um, uh, there was also, I think, about 20% had um, uh, trust in financial institutions, right. and I asked Edelman why that was so high. Um, <laughs> I said, don't people read the newspaper? But in any event, um, there was an article many years ago in the New York Times that talked about how when people, um, it's not so much small business, but I think it overlaps a little bit with small business, that family-owned businesses tended to have higher levels of trust and also mostly because the families were, were playing a longer game 
And people said, you know, people assumed, and I think it's in many instances correct, that if your name was on the business, or if you were really intimately involved with the business, that you would, you would be concerned about your reputation, you would be concerned about your, um, you would be concerned about what people would say about you. I still remember a zillion years ago, uh, it was a long time ago, when Toshiro Honda, the man himself of Honda Motor Company, came and gave a talk at Stanford. It was a long time ago. General Motors was having trouble then in terms of quality and whatever. And somebody asked Mr. Honda what was wrong with General Motors. And he said, you know, he said if they had their name, he said if, I don't even remember, it was the CEO at the time. He said if his name were on the cars like my name was, he said he would be worried more about them breaking down. He said because no one wants them swearing at the Honda, the damn Hondas, you know, broken down by the side of the road. He said they're swearing at me. He said so he had this personal identity. So I think one of the differences between small businesses and large businesses is small businesses are much more likely to be owned and managed by an individual who has a much greater identity with the company and with the product and with the service and with the customer and therefore is going to be a better steward of the relationship and of the organization. So I think that's why in general people will trust small businesses more than large businesses. Mm -hmm. And the level, low level of trust I think is because companies, I'm sure with the exception of the people sitting in this room, have actually done I think a pretty bad They've done a pretty bad job over the last several years um, in telling the truth. Um, you know, to, to, you know, to put it simply, whether it's Jimmy Kane of Bear Stearns saying that his balance sheet was in good shape three days before they went under, or Dick Fold of Lehman Brothers basically making the same statement, or people going out and saying we're not going to do layoffs, and then a week later laying people off, or whatever. I mean, you know. So as I said on that panel. If you want people to trust you, you know, I have a very simple prescription, tell the truth, um, which is not going on, I think, uh, to the extent that it should be. Mm -hmm. You know, similar kind of challenge in our society. We've, in the last four or five years, the number of Ponzi schemes has just been incredible. And when you compare the last five years with the previous five years, uh, the data, it, it's striking, the number of Ponzi schemes. Uh, it, is there a fundamental problem with our kind of underlying ethical culture uh, that people what, what what do you in a word yes, yes. <laughs> in, a, in a word yes I, I we have um, it's an issue of uh, means and ends and I think people have um, become quite utilitarian where the ends justify the means or to quote the famous now deceased Parks Commissioner Robert Moses of New York, if the ends don't justify the means, what does? But, um, uh, but, uh, but, but we have become, I think, very much into um, you know, the results and not worried so much about how we get the results. And so whatever, kind of whatever, we've, we've built a whatever it takes attitude, not in a good way of, you know, we'll do whatever it takes in order to, to accomplish something, but whatever it takes in terms of, you know, whatever it takes um, uh, to make money, we are become, an extremely uh, money-oriented society. It's one of the things that a Bloomberg Business Week asked me to write a little blog because they like me or something anyway around the, uh, around the start of the first of the year and my editor Ira Sager said write something about what you want to have happen in 2013 and so I wrote something that basically said what I would love to have happen in 2013 is that we would discuss that everything would not be reduced to money. So we talk about Medicare and Medicaid and whether we're going to cut Medicare and Medicaid or how much money we're going to put into Medicare and Medicaid and to take one example and we forget the fact that there's a lot of research that, 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 that demonstrates that people who have access to health care actually live longer and, and are much more likely to have better health care uh, than if you don't have access to health care through health insurance or whatever. And similarly, you know, I sat on the Committee for Faculty and Staff Human Resources at Stanford which talks a lot about our health costs. And, uh, and I normally try to intentionally sit next to our CFO, who's a Stanford Business School grad, and keep, and keep reminding him uh, that healthcare costs are not just about costs, they're also about health. You know, so you say healthcare costs, <laughs> there are three words in that phrase. <laughs> <laughs> one is health, one is care, one is costs. Uh, cost is only one third of healthcare costs. But we talk about everything um, in terms of money. Oftentimes you'll see the war about, uh, in Iraq and Afghanistan 
talked about in terms of dollars and cents and savings, which are obviously important, but it's also the case that men serving, in, and women serving in Iraq and Afghanistan have in many instances you know, come home with parts of their body missing and many of them came home in, in caskets. And so I think we need, to talk, we need to talk about human values and hum, human outcomes, not just, just not, not just economics. And I think there's been way too much uh, consideration of, of, of just money as opposed to you know, health, well-being, uh, physical and mental health and well-being, all these other things that are, that are part of uh, the human experience. Now we mo both, you and I made a great choice today because we pursued health. We didn't have the gravy with the biscuits, so, yes, so that was good. So if we were, so if we were thinking about, not what, not what they were thinking, or, but if you were to say, what are the two things, if you had to choose two things that you wanted to say, this is what business ought to be thinking. And one, you just talked about money and focus on money, but if there were two things that you said, this is what business ought to be thinking about, mm. what, what would you say? Well, I think business, I think, you know, so I can quote my friend who I had the privilege of meeting when he was still alive, which is a much easier time to meet him. Uh, Peter, Drucker, uh, <laughs> Peter Drucker used to say business is actually very simple. We have made it very complicated, but business is actually simple. There is no business without a customer. Um, so if you take care of your customers, uh, you will have a business. Uh, I remind my friends in the airline industry of this on a regular basis. They, <laughs> they of course, have completely ignored me, but <laughs> it's all right. Um, so I think that's one thing. I think business needs to act, and many businesses, many organizations, both profit and nonprofit, have forgotten uh, or have lost touch with uh, the customer. Um, there are, or there was, um, a CEO of a U.S. airline who flew to a meeting to discuss a merger on his private jet which says something. Uh, he doesn't want to fly on his airline because, of course, it doesn't fly on time. But um, um, <laughs> I, 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 think, I think one of the things that happens in, in large organizations, or maybe even in small ones, the higher you go up, the less contact you often have with the work of the organization and with the customers. So you have retailers who are never in the stores. You have CEOs of hospitals who, who don't really understand what's going on in the hospital. Um, are, you know, you have um, uh, college and university presidents who don't know who the students are. Of course, there are exceptions, and many of them, in fact, do. But, but I think in many instances, so we, we have lost touch with what, what our organizations are about, uh, which is, you know, the, produce, the production of a good and service and the delivery of that to a customer, and who are the customers, and what are we doing with and for the customers? So I would say that is number one. As so, you know, follow the advice of Peter Drucker. And secondly, I would su suggest um, to understand feedback loops and to think a little bit longer term, because in, in many instances we've done things in the short term, which have you know, which have hurt us in the in the long term. Um, so you know, you need to take a longer time horizon, and you need to. Um, you need to take care of your customer. And if you do those two things, you'll probably be okay. What about other stakeholders? Because you have companies, obviously, you have, besides customers, you have employees. Yeah. Well, one of the lessons I've learned from my dear friend Ken Theory, the CEO of the kidney dialysis company, DaVita, is he said, you know, many people believe that there are trade-offs that you have to make, that you can, you know, I can take care of my shareholders, or I can take care of my customers, I can take care of my customers, I can take care of my employees. In most instances, you face a virtuous cycle in which if you take care, you know, as in the words of Herb Keller of Southwest Airlines, if you take, we take care of our, we put our employees first, our customers second, our shareholders third. Uh, we take care of our employees and therefore they deliver a good, and therefore they're productive, deliver good experience to the customers. So the customers come back and uh, then, uh, then of course the shareholders are happy. Um, so in many instances I think, um, it, 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 all, it all fits together. If you take care of your employees um, and, and build a, you know, a committed, highly talented group of people who you've invested in their training and, you've, um, and, and they're there for a while, um, they will be productive and they will be able to build relationships with the customers. The customers will be happy and get well cared for. And as uh, Fred Reichold of Bain pointed out in a book, The Loyalty Effect, many years ago, the key to profitability in most industries, certainly in financial services, but in many other industries as well, is customer retention. 
because it costs much more money to get new people to come than it does to make the ones who are there happy. Um, and so, you know, so if you've got loyal employees taking good care of the customers, the customers stay, and then the shareholders are happy. Um, and also, of course, you need to take care of the community. Mm -hmm. So let's, follow, I want to follow up a little bit on the, really the notion of unbundling that happens in business, in the business world today, where it's you know, a very, very popular topic in business schools now to look at in industries like music, where, in, in fact, I have, I think, 12 boxes of vinyl records at home. If anyone would like to make a bid on that, please let me know. My <laughs> wife would love to see them gone. Um, but vinyl records are gone, and CDs are gone, and now you have the individual products. So, so is, is our business world just so fundamentally different, or is it really the same as it was in 50 or 1960 or 1980? Are, are the problems, because of things like unbundling and globalization, are they fundamentally different? Or do you think they're no. really the same? I think they're fundamentally the same. I mean, what, what has happened in selling music in smaller um, increments or smaller segments, or maybe not selling it, giving it away, or downloading it. Um, on a daily basis, I see who is downloading free my last book and <laughs> email my publisher who you know, does the takedown thing. But holding that aside, I, I think you know, people wanted to buy um, People want to buy music in smaller segments, and they don't want um, the producer to decide the 12 or 14 songs that go together. They want to make their own albums, and the technology now permits them to do that uh, to some extent. Of course, they're no longer albums; they're on the MP3 player. Um, so I think you know, I think the music business has done a pretty good job—not perfect—of uh, being responsive uh, to the customers. And and so I think a lot of what you see in the evolution of business is an evolution of delivering the product or service in the ways in which consumers want and when they want it. So, um, so to me, that actually, I think, and, and so it's just, you know, as consumer tastes evolve and as consumer preferences for how and where they buy things evolve, uh, the smart organizations will figure out how to do that because there is no business without a customer. Um, so I don't think that is fundamentally, um, I don't think it's a fundamental shift. Obviously, technology has shifted many things including our ability to, to do a bunch of things and deliver things in different ways and to make sure that there's no privacy anymore, but that's another story. Uh, but, uh, uh, but no, I, th I, think the, I think the successful business has always been good at figuring out, hopefully even before the customer figures out, uh, what will appeal uh, to the customers and then delivering that in, 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 the, in the size of the packages that they want. Mm -hmm. So what does that do for business education? When I think about, you know, if you re record your lectures, I could like reduce faculty costs significantly by <laughs> showing your lectures yes. and reducing the faculty. I won't need all of our faculty. This would be amazing, right? Yes, it would so, be amazing. So, <laughs> <laughs> is that a what, well? What you know, I I the, think this is a wonderful question. I don't think anybody knows what the online and the MOOCs and all this other stuff is going to do. Um, to education. I've heard all kinds of predictions. I don't know if they're true or not. I can tell you that, um, that I do not believe you can, re you can replicate the, um, certainly the Stanford experience uh, on the, to an online thing. I mean, a lot of this is around interaction. It is around uh, the experience of the beautiful campus and it's apparently world-class golf course. I'm not a golfer. And people say, for me to be a faculty member at Stanford with access to that golf course and not play golf is like a cardinal sin, but that's okay. <laughs> uh, you know, uh, the, the, a the atmosphere, the arts, the, the stuff, um, uh, you know, the, the football team, which you all would know about. Uh, you know, I mean, I mean it's very hard. Uh, you can watch it on TV or on, on your computer, but there's something different to be in the stadium, uh, to be in contact with, with, with people. So my sense is, is that what the online uh, courses will do is provide um, the ability to access uh, a part of the experience and some aspect of the experience for people who otherwise would never be able to get uh, uh, to Fort Worth and to TCU or to Stanford because there are many people around the world who won't be able to do that. Uh, but for the people who are able to and able to afford to, um, uh, there will always, I think, be a market for the, for the in-person stuff. If you've engaged in any 
I mean, I get these companies all the time that say, you know, instead of flying you here, um, let's, do, let's do a webinar. And uh, I have no problem with that. Um, but if you actually look at what people do during the webinar, <laughs> they do many things besides watch the webinar. I mean, they're checking their emails and whatever. And contrary uh, to what everybody believes, there has been a bunch of research on this, people are not better multiprocessors. They are multiprocessing, but they are not better multiprocessors. And so, you know, you can't really learn anything while you're checking your email and checking your stock portfolio and doing 14 other things at once. Uh, none of them very well. Uh, so, uh, but I think there will be a challenge um, to education, not just business education, but to higher education in general. I mean, Clayton Christensen at Harvard Business School has said that, uh, that uh, universities are about to be disrupted like many other industries, and there, and there, is, a, and there is an issue in terms of the, um, the prices that are charged and the value that is delivered, so, but that's okay. Um, you know, the places that deliver great value and actually educate people and graduate them, and they go out and they learn a lot, and they've met a bunch of people who they can, who've been, and they build social relationships with, and so they can leverage those social relationships will be fine. And the ones who are just, you know, collecting government money for nothing, you know, which is, um, as we know, there's some of those too, uh, we'll probably have a great deal of trouble, but it's okay. I'm, Stanford, Stanford isn't worried. We just apparently last year collected a billion dollars in donations, so it's, it's okay. And the good news is my wife says, be glad you're as old as you are. <laughs> By the time it all falls apart, you'll be somewhere else. <laughs> you know, my wife, she also says, I, I, I shouldn't multiprocess, particularly when she's talking. Uh, so <laughs> yeah, no one should multiprocess. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so, so the, the, the secret to a long marriage is don't multiprocess. <laughs> <laughs> one more question, and we'll open it to the audience. Fine. Uh, you've um, spoken or led con conferences or in 34 different countries, I believe. Is Actually, now 37. 37. 37. And when I go to Ecuador this summer, it'll be 38. 38. <laughs> so if you were advising CEOs, in companies from different countries. Would the messages be different at all? Would they be similar? No. What do you think? People are people. Uh, we've all come from the same evolutionary roots. Um, I think uh, the basic uh, human psychology, people around the world, I mean my friends at AES many years ago would operate power plants around the world and everywhere they'd go everybody said, well you can't do that here because people are different. Uh, but people are people. Human beings uh, all, all over the world want to be tr treated with respect and dignity. People all over the world want to be told the truth. People all over the world have a basic human need, which is um, to learn and grow. I mean, everybody in this room, uh, many of you have children, all of you were. Um, and, uh, you know, none of you were lear learned to walk uh, because somebody gave you a pay for performance scheme that said, you know, we're going we're gonna to pay, we're going to pay you for walking. Um, human, 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 human beings are naturally curious. It's why it's part of our ingrown survival instinct. And so people want to learn and grow and master new things. Uh, people want to make decisions, uh, particularly decisions that affect their lives and well-being. And, uh, and everybody wants to do that. And so I have found, um, I don't know, maybe everybody's polite, but, uh, but certainly, the, you know, I'm not a cultural expert on 37 countries when I go to Saudi Arabia four weeks from tomorrow, um, you know, which is also an interesting experience. Uh, you know, I don't, I'm not going to become an expert on Saudi culture, though I will know a few things that to not do or say. But, uh, but beyond that, it is, it is mostly about delivering the, a, a very similar set of messages um, and a very similar set of, of theories uh, to people around the world because the, the evidence suggests to the extent, I mean, the studies haven't been done in every single country, but when the studies have been done in multiple countries, it's more similar than different. The manifestations, of course, are different. Uh, but the basic human, basic humans, are, pe people are people. And, 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 well, and their fears and hopes and, you know, prayers and, and, and kind of issues are, are, are actually quite similar. And by the way, if you actually look, now that I'm an expert on comparative religion either, um, but if you actually look at religions, uh, oftentimes the basic precepts are quite similar um, for, for the same reason that, 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 that the human experience um, is, is, is very similar. Everybody has to deal with the fact that we're all going to die. And so every religion 
deals in its own way with, 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 with the fact of mortality. Everybody, every religion has to deal with the meaning of life. Every, every religion deals with how are you going to treat your neighbors and your friends. Um, and, and, and how are you going to relate to other human beings? And the prescriptions, I think, are fairly similar for the same reason, that because we are all people and we all deal with the same existential issues. Interesting. That's more philosophical than I try to be. But it's <laughs> okay. well, let's open it again to questions you have. Again, uh, Dr. Pepper has had an incredible experience in different industries and different topics, but now's your chance. So. Over. I saw a hand right here. Uh, earlier, you, you were talking about kind of the human experience, keeping that human element there. And I guess um, you hear a lot about, okay, our, our, industry, our business is struggling. You know, it's all of a sudden you go out and you're cutting salaries. Or you're, and, and of course, the, one of the big ticket items is, is health care and stuff like that. That's a big ticket item to also be able to cut out. But obviously, that has negative connotations or you know what what advice would you give for all of a sudden an industry that, you know our company is struggling to you know it's easy to look at the numbers in the economics without understanding you know what impact that's going to have on that what advice do you give companies when you meet with them and try to navigate them through those types of so that's a great question, and I would <coughs> answer in, I think, several different ways. First of all, um, some years ago, I met a man by the name of John Whitney, who had led uh, Pathmark through a difficult uh, the supermarket chain in the East. Um, it was facing bankruptcy. Actually, since it's faced bankruptcy, but so before that. So John Whitney had come to Pathmark um, as, uh, to turn it around. It was on the verge of bankruptcy. And so he went to the bankers and uh, creditors who had hired him. They weren't in Chapter 11, but they were close. Uh, and they said, well, John, we've hired you. We're going to hire you into this organization. Um, what are you going to do? And he said, well, I'm going to do two things. The first thing I'm going to do is after I'm sure that we have the right number of people, and if not, we'll get rid of the people. But he says, once I'm sure I, we've got the organization pretty much staffed, well, I'm going to tell everybody there will be no more layoffs. And then I'm going to take people, the store manager's salaries, and I'm going to raise them. And the bankers, of course, looked at me and said, you've got to be crazy. And he said, I'll tell you what. He said, you've offered me a ton of stock options at about a dollar a share, which was, by the way, much higher than the stock price was. Um, he said, how many options would you offer me at $5 a share? And they said, you know, said, well, first of all, you're going to like, drive the company into the ground, so you, you name a number. John Whitney became a very wealthy man. John Whitney's theory was very simple. He said, the interesting thing is, he said, we oftentimes lay people off and cut salaries at the very, he said, you know, he said, when business is going well, idiots can be successful, and many of them are. It is when the times are the toughest that you need your best talent, right? So if you need your best talent when times are toughest, what you want to do is have a set of management practices, including layoffs and pay, that require the best talent, that, that, that are able you to attract and retain the best talent. A.G. Lafley, the former chairman of Procter & Gamble, has said, the best time to gain market share is when your competitors are in retreat. So I would invite you, you know, I'm a Stanford professor shouldn't believe anything I say, uh, but it can all be checked. So I invite you to go uh, to look at the history of Air Asia, the Malaysian airline started by Tony Fernandez. Every time the airline industry goes into crisis, Tony does a very simple thing. He expands. He expands. So the last airline crisis, he's now gone international. The airline crisis before then, he ordered 200 Airbus A320s or something. And the deal, and the, it's by the way, my friends at SAS Institute, the largest privately owned software company in the world, same model. In the tech downturn at 2000, 2001, Jim Goodnight and SAS hired 850 customer service people, and their job was to call a bunch of clients that they did not yet have and say, what's going on with your 
enterprise statistical analysis software service provider. Can you get an answer on the phone? And of course you can't. Come to us. We will provide the service that everybody else is no longer providing. So the irony is, I mean, if we thought about this in, legal, in, in war terms, it would be obvious. The easiest time to advance on the battlefield is when, your, is, is when your enemy is in retreat. And somehow business hasn't figured that out. So our enemies retreat and we're gonna retreat also. You know, and so we have a race to the bottom. You know. <laughs> we do, we have a race to the bottom. So you, know, you, get, you, you call these customer service lines, you get this thing, you know, your call is very important to us. No, it isn't. If, <laughs> if my call were important to you, you would answer it. I mean, you know, if you think about it. Uh, so, uh, uh, so I think, I think oftentimes we do exactly um, the wrong thing. If you look at my friend Richard Kovacevic, who for many years ran Wells Fargo, uh, first he ran Norwest, then he merged it with Wells Fargo. His deal was, you know, it was all about managing the culture and managing the customer experience. That, you know, the people should be able to reach you when you call you. I mean, you know, and, and it's, um, so, so my advice is to, you know, you know, to play, you, you can, you, you need to think about what you're gonna do to, to win. Um, many, many organizations believe they have a cost problem. Many countries believe they have a, a, a cost problem. It's all a revenue problem. The reason why we're running in the United States trillion dollar deficits is only partly because we're spending more money. Most of it is because our tax revenues have fallen so dramatically during the recession. The problem in the airline industry, my favorite, is not costs. It is in fact revenues. Uh, between the year 2000 and the year 2007, according to an article in the New York Times, the U.S. airlines lost 47 percent of their premium customers. Premium customers defined, defined as full fare coach, first or business class, 47 percent. If anybody in this room is running a business where you can lose 47 percent of your best customers and still be in business, come see me because I want to buy stock in you. This is a true number. In the year 2008, According to a survey done by the IATA, this is the Airline Trade Association, the, US, the world airline industry had $9.6 billion in foregone revenue from people who found flying so unpleasant that they didn't do it. In a fixed cost industry, $10 billion of revenue means that in the year 2008, the world airline industry would have been profitable had they not driven their customers away. And I can go industry by industry. Banking, securities brokerage, and I can show you example after example where organizations have driven their customers away. You have a revenue problem. In most instances when people think they have a cost problem, they actually have a revenue problem. You fix your revenues, the costs don't matter. And they don't matter very much. I mean, it's the wisdom of John Mackey down the road of Whole Foods Markets who understood that if you gave cost of people food they wanted to eat, they would not be so price sensitive, which is how he's been able to build margins that would make, you know, and build a very profitable business. So this is around, you know, what do I do? So the question I always ask people is, yes, you know, you want to minimize your costs? I can tell you exactly how to minimize your costs. I can get your cost to zero, close. Um, your, your, your objective in business is not to minimize your cost, it is to maximize the profit, which is the, which is the difference, obviously, between costs and revenues. So, you know, I have people tell me, you know, I've cut my labor costs. I've hired, you know, these people. I said, great, you know, you've hired a bunch of people, they can't do anything and they don't know anything, but, you know, presumably through some miracle, they're gonna deliver economic value and they're gonna get customers into the stores or, uh, provide service. The question isn't what people cost, the question is what can they do? So if you know, if I pay you nothing but you do less, I haven't saved anything. <laughs> if I pay you a lot but it turns out you're extremely productive and you're brilliant and talented and do a lot, then you know, then maybe it's well worth it. I mean, you know, so it, I, I think we need to think in a little more systemic global way about the, about, the, about the business challenges. That's a long answer to a great question though, thank you. Great. Yes? Uh, Yahoo's been in the news recently because its CEO gently suggested that her remote employees come into uh, work. How do you see the growing trend of uh, less face-to-face -face interaction affecting business or even society in general? 
I believe in, you know, I believe in, um, I believe that it's important to actually, you know, see people <laughs> and chat with them. Many years ago, I had the privilege of meeting the late, now late, of course, everybody who I meet dies. It's like a sad, <laughs> <laughs> sad thing. The late, the late Jack Valenti of the Motion Picture Association of America, uh, who, of course, uh, accomplished the Digital Media Copyright Act against the opposition of all the high-tech people. And when he came to my class, somebody said, how did you beat all these high-tech companies? And he said, they sent emails, I did lunches. Um, uh, <laughs> uh, which is literally true. I mean, you know, so I mean, it, it, there is, there's a great article about him in the New Yorker magazine from many years ago. It's called The Personal Touch. Um, and I think there is really no substitute uh, for, you know, for personal contact, for looking people in the eye, uh, for shaking their hand. Um, uh, people tell me, I guess you could do everything online. I don't, uh, or remotely, I'm not so sure. Um, so um, it's interesting. Often, oftentimes, I think we have pursued efficiency at the cost of effectiveness. So the question is not, you know, how many phone calls can I process per day or how many whatevers can I do? The question is, at the end of all of this, what have I accomplished? I mean, many years ago, Southwest Airlines figured out something which many organizations have not done, which is they said, you know, they said the objective when you call a reservations agent is not to get you off the phone quickly. The objective when you call a reservations agent is to sell you a ticket. So we're going to evaluate you on the percentage of calls that result in a ticket, not whether you're off the phone in 20 seconds. Because uh, you know, if I process 100 calls in an hour and sell no tickets, I actually have been efficient but not very effective. Um, and, and similarly, I think oftentimes in our interactions, we think, you know, well, I've spent you know, only a couple minutes talking to my friend Homer here. Uh, and you know, so, so that's this quickly, because now I can talk to 50 people in 100 minutes. The question is not how many minutes did I, did I spend with this individual. The question is, did I accomplish something? Did I accomplish part of what I was, what I was trying to accomplish? So I, we've, I think, oftentimes got the wrong metrics and the wrong ways of, are, are metrics that, that are misleading to us in some important ways. That's a question. We have one last question. Oh my goodness, one last, we're out of time already. Yes. See, time flies when you're having fun, <laughs> or when you're waiting for American Airlines, yes. <laughs> <laughs> you talked a little bit about the, uh, the role of compensation in terms of retaining and attracting key employees, a little bit about pay uh, performance sensitivity. What is your take on uh, the effectiveness of pay performance uh, schemes in terms of getting employees, and particularly top executives, to do the things the organization wants them to uh, do. And what, what's the role in that, in, in terms of uh, kind of aligning incentives uh, effective? OK, well, that's, that's a question that we could spend hours um, both answering and debating. Um, I am actually not, uh, I'm, I'm, a big, I'm a big fan of higher pay, because you basically get what you pay for in labor markets like in every other market. And so you ought to re re recruit talented people. Most pay for performance schemes, I think, don't work very well because few organizations either are clever enough or have a simple enough objective function that they know exactly what they want. So, you know, if you, if you pay, you get what you pay for, it turns out oftentimes you don't want it. Um, so it is the case um, that, you know, that stock options, if you think about it, stock options are supposed to align people's interests. They actually don't very well. Mostly because if you don't have any restrictions, um, stock options mean the stock price only has to be high for, if you think about it, one day. On, on that day, I get to sell all my options. So actually, you know, I mean, many of the Enron people left, and they were quite wealthy because the, because the stock price was temporarily high. Um, in the city of Albuquerque, New Mexico, they put in a pay for performance scheme uh, for garbage collectors. I love this story. Because uh, they, they said, we're, we're paying too much overtime to the garbage collection crews. Uh, so let's put in a system that says, you will pay you your full eight hours, of, you know, regardless of how long it takes you to collect the garbage. Well, you know, if I say to you, and you can think about this, a little nano minute yourself, if I say to you, you know, you're going to get paid eight hours for collecting the garbage fast, what are you going to do? Many of you will be clever enough to, of course, immediately recognize what you're going to do. The first thing is, you can finish your route faster if you don't collect all the garbage. So the city of Albuquerque was winding up sending out you know, garbage trucks to pick up the garbage that have been missed. It turns out you can collect garbage faster if you speed. The city of Albuquerque was winding up spending a lot of money settling suits uh, from all the accidents. 
And finally, it turns out you can collect more garbage if you don't bother to go back to the dump. And so they were driving their trucks overweight. And this was reported in an article in the Associated Press uh, under the title, um, Albuquerque Grand Jury, in, in civil grand jury, in panel to understand why paper for performance is costing the city so much money. Um, so you often get what you pay for, but you don't always want it. Uh, so you need to be very careful as you de devise these schemes uh, to make sure that you've a thought of everything, uh, because people will, uh, people will do what you pay them for. Um, so we've now incented in many school districts around the country, and Steve Levitt of Freakonomics fame has written about this, we've incented school districts around the country uh, to have higher test scores. Well, the simplest way to get higher test scores, not necessarily the best way, but the simplest way to get higher test scores is, of course, to give the students the answers. <laughs> and, so, and so there's been studies done that demonstrate that the more you gear uh, teacher into bonuses uh, to student test scores, the higher the rate of cheating. Uh, there's a, you know, because this is the way you, you know, they, oh, my goodness, I was supposed to get a higher test scores. You didn't tell me how. <laughs> you know, so it's, uh, you need to be, you need to be a little clever about this. We done? Thank you. One of the other things that Peter Drucker said, I can't quote exactly, but he differentiated between success and significance. That success, success was about accomplishment and significance was about having a lasting and positive and durable impact on people. And I think those of us that know uh, Dr. Pepper, through his work, through the years, both with companies and education, know that you've been a man of significance. So thank you for being with us today, thank and thank pleasure. you for being our Green Honors Professor. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.